Hey, how we doing today, everybody? Nick with True Crime King back again. Today, I'm going to be doing a video on fentanyl. I'm sure uh, most of you know somebody that's been affected by fentanyl, whether it's a family member or a friend or just a friend of a friend. Um, you know, it's, it's a pandemic now uh, and uh, over a hundred thousand people die every year for, uh, from fentanyl now and uh, i just wanted to um spread some awareness so uh, um, this one i'm definitely not going to be doing too much talking uh, don't forget like and subscribe remember i'm a new channel so I'm still trying to figure out what works and what I want to cover, but uh, yeah, let me know in the comments if if you guys uh, like like what uh, you see. So here we go. When you think about substance abuse, you never think that it will happen to your family, and when it hit our family the way it did with my sister i promised myself that i would get the word out that the opioid addiction does not discriminate it happens to the least of us to the most of us my sister was a doctor she had a phd in education she was a minister just the person who you would least suspect to be addicted to opiates. People need to understand that the opioid addiction is a physiological addiction. So just like I crave water, it's the same way people who have the addiction with opiates, they crave the drug. Initially, my sister was prescribed opiates for knee and back pain. I really... That's how it starts for a lot of people. Uh, you know, like, back, especially, like, a couple, like, 10, 15, 20 years ago, if you got hurt in any kind of way, the doctors, you know, they would, they would get paid to, you know, sell the prescriptions so and the more opiates they they prescribe to people the, the, the more the, the pharmaceutical companies would give the doctors they didn't they, they didn't care about you know what would happen to the patient if they you know got addicted to the opiates so I really believe that she wasn't able to get the prescription by doctors anymore so she turned to the next best thing that she could to get that fix. And that's when she started reaching out to negative influences. Um, yeah, if you don't, like she couldn't get the prescription anymore. So if you don't, if you don't have the opiate in your body and you have an addiction, you can't even move. You're, you're the sickest you've ever been in your life. And you're you're throwing up out of both ends of your body, and it's it's the worst pain uh, you can go through. Um, and drug dealers. I'm a federal probation officer. I deal with this kind of stuff all the time. But when it happened in my family, it 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 just. It, it caught us all by surprise. My sister and I were extremely close. Uh, we were best friends. If you saw her, you saw me. And when it hit so close to home, I, you know, I make referrals to drug treatment all the time. I never in a million years thought that I would have to do this for my sister. But I did, and it was tough. 
but the addiction was so powerful. She was in a lot of denial. She did a lot of deflecting. She pointed the finger at other things going on, but she never accepted responsibility. And it was, was very hard. She was such a strong human being. She was like, she was my rock. She was my everything. And just so everybody knows, I used to have a, a addiction to opiates, really bad. So I, you know, when I'm talking, I'm talking from experience. She always came to my rescue. She was more than, you know, just a big sister. Like she would tell anybody, don't mess with my sister. You know, that's, that's the kind of person she was. So when this happened, I think in my mind, I thought, well, I, I knew that she would be able to beat this. If anybody could beat this, Karen could beat it. And so when COVID hit and everybody was on lockdown, there were signs, but I don't, I didn't recognize those signs until after the fact. I had to go through grief counseling because six months prior to her dying, I had already lost her. And I, I, yeah, I had already lost her. So I, I, I actually started going through grief counseling because I knew at that point there was nothing else I could do. Uh, I know for a fact a lot of people in my family and, and a lot of my friends thought I was going to. So. My sister was very charismatic and my sister was a very strong motivational speaker, a very powerful minister. And she knew that Bible inside and out. And when she started to use scripture to justify some of the things she had done, I knew this isn't this this isn't Karen. This this is not my sister. Because she was the type of person, she didn't tolerate foolishness. She didn't tolerate, you know, people making dumb mistakes. Her thing was, you're doing this because you want to do it, and I'm not going to be a part of it. That's the kind of... And, yeah, that's what everybody thinks that it hasn't, you know, done or been addicted to opiates or doing it because they want to, you know. I know for me, I wasn't doing it because I want to, wanted to. Uh, you know, I wasn't maybe at first, you know, but after a while, you do it because you need to and you have to. Person she was. And so when her addiction got exposed, I started noticing that she's not accepting responsibility for the addiction. Karen, I think. And that, yeah, that's a big part of it too. You, I mean, the first step to to getting clean is you have to accept that you have a problem. And if you never do that, then you're never gonna get try and get help. Was dealing with some depression. I think that she was just going through a lot. And so when she died, my husband and I was like, you know, everybody's blaming everybody, but nobody's blaming Karen. And it's not something that Karen wanted. I know she didn't. I know my sister did not want to die, but the drug was just so powerful. And because she was such a strong person, weakness just was not in her vocabulary. It, it just wasn't. And so probably to admit that I'm weak, I'm powerless against, it, against you know, this addiction, 
um, she just couldn't do it. She did go on substance abuse treatment once, though. I was so proud of her. She was weaned off of the, the pills, and things were going great. Things were really going great, but she relapsed. And so when she relapsed, when... Well, that's normal. Um, most people relapse uh, when, you know, a, a couple times before they actually get clean. I mean, it takes a lot of willpower, and you have, you have to have support. If you don't have support, you're not going to make it. You have to have support from somebody. When the conversation was, I've been calling my counselor, but she's not calling me back. Okay, now the probation officer hat is kicking in. Okay, yeah. And she would say it over and over, and she would be so convincing. Oh, my God. She would be so convincing. I've been calling that counselor, and that counselor's not been calling me back. And so, finally, I just had to tell her, okay. Okay. So, she was sick. I was at work and got a phone call that the paramedics were at her house and they couldn't resuscitate her and her husband had come home from work working on a night job he came home from work and found her passed out unresponsive um she was gone yeah she was gone there were there were pills um and what she would always do is to intensify the high she would take her pills with wine and that's literally how she was found that's how she died she died at home yeah when you buy drugs from a drug dealer you don't know what you're getting and so essentially that's what happened yeah, that's true. I mean, you know, they could tell you it's one drug and it could be rat poison. You have no idea what is in that pill. I mean, these drug dealers have pill presses, you know, all kinds of shit. Excuse my language, but yeah, they have all kinds of stuff. Um, they could put anything in a pill or powder you know, or anything, you know. You don't know what it is. When I got a copy of her death certificate, it said on there, fentanyl. Fentanyl, hydrocodone, uh, ethanol, and alprazolam. Alprazolam is Xanax. So, so she had two opiate, two kinds of opiates alcohol and xanax alcohol xanax and hydrocodone and and a lot of people will use xanax with opiates to could in wine or beer because that increases the, the high as well the reason on her death certificate it said substance abuse so. and, and right there you know a lot of families they don't like the stigma you know attached with that and so no one wants to talk about it and so and that makes it even worse because if you don't talk about it then no one's going to get help so that's how she died and I know she did not commit suicide because that was that was not Karen, um, but I do believe she overdosed because she didn't know what she was getting. I think we didn't talk about it. I don't know. I think she might have known what she was getting. She just didn't know how strong it was. I mean, nowadays, I mean, if she had fentanyl, the fentanyl is 50 times stronger than than the heroin used to be. 
So everything now, that's why there's so many overdoses now is because the drugs are, are so much stronger than they used to. You can do, you could do a smaller amount than what you're used to doing, but it would, it will be stronger. And so you'll think you're not anywhere close to overdosing, but in reality, you're doing way more than enough to kill you. Um, like we probably should have because of pride. Um, yeah, see, because of pride and, and, and the stigma, they didn't, they didn't. And that is the worst thing to deal with when you're dealing with someone with, with substance abuse. It is, it's, you have to push the pride to the side. You, you can't. I think that's why it took me so long to get help because a lot of people uh, didn't want to talk about it for a long time. Can't be embarrassed um, because it happens. It happens. But yeah, that's it. Have a good day and Talk about it. Push the pride aside. True Crime King out.